All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Amen. To be here to worship God in spirit and truth. You know, I love to believe that it, it, it that the word is absolutely right. There were two or more are gathered in the presence of the Lord. There shall he also be. I'm here. Deacon Manila's here. That's the prerequisite too. Amen. We have enough to have Bible study right now. And I just believe that when God shows up, he doesn't show up by himself. He brings Jesus and he brings the Holy Spirit. And so all we have to do is just go with where God is leading and to trust him. And that he will literally open up the windows of heaven and pour us out a blessing. So let's do this. Let's have an opening word of prayer. Then we'll have a Q&A session if there are any questions that we have with our studying, with our reading, with our dialogue, and discussing with other people. It may be even reflections from Sunday sermon. Um, and then after that, we'll pick up where we left off in our study on prayer. We only have seven more screens of prayer. And so, we, uh, and so we're going to leave there. We're going to start our we'll start examination of Genesis. We're going to go to the beginning of the Bible. We're just going to work our way through. Uh, as, as thus says the Lord. So here let us have our opening word of prayer. Dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, God, we thank you this day for this is the day that you have made, God. We are glad. We are rejoicing in it. Father God, we pray at this time that you will bless us, God, with understanding. You will bless us, God, with knowledge. You will bless us, God, with discernment and wisdom so that we're best able to serve you as disciples and the stewards that you call us to be. Father God, we thank you for everything you're doing, how you're doing. We pray, God, you continue to be a blessing to us. Father God, we love you, we honor you, and we cherish you. God, bless those who are here, bless those who are on their way, bless those who want to be here but could not be here. And Father God, bless those who are, uh, are you're sending our way and don't even know yet that they're about to join this beautiful, wonderful body of believers. Father God, we love you and thank you. It's in your son's mighty matchless, marvelous, magnificent name. We do pray. Amen. 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 So let's begin like we always do. Are there any questions, concerns, things that you read, things that you may have heard, things that you've been discussing with friendly, family and friends that you want further uh, dialogue or understanding on? Is there anything? Well, we, I started uh, a conversation prior to us uh -huh. going online uh -huh. um, regarding last Sunday's program yes. in which I was absent. Yes. And we discussed, um, or I had said I got word that the program Sunday was uh, very good. Yes, it was. And the music was, was very helpful. Yes. Uh, with the drums and the, and the keyboard. Uh, keyboard and <laughs> all that just went. It's a real singer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but the point being that um, I, if, if I'm hearing that kind of thing, um, should we be putting forth uh, some effort to try to Continue that kind of Yes, thing. yes. The answer is a resounding yes. Uh, especially for the one who's murdering your ears. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, it, no, it, I, I, I want you to know uh, <laughs> you're putting forth an effort to bring a musical um, dynamic right. that maybe some people don't. Are you understand? To. Right. I'm, I, I'm a part of. It. Right. But I, I just, uh, I feel real good about what you're a doing. Amen. In that regard. Praise God. But sometimes you can't switch them too fast from one thing to another thing so rapidly. Right. <laughs> but at the ease and at the end of the law. Right. So I just heard from several people. Uh -huh. Uh, how much they enjoy sure. the church service. Amen. And I think they were sending a message. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you know what? The, uh, the, the young ladies that came in to lead praise and worship and actually sang for us, they, they did send the message in the sense that we want to just worship God. And we yeah. want to worship Him. We don't want to make this bit to do out of it, but this, we just want to have simple worship pure worship where it's just us 
giving God our best. Okay. And, and the interesting thing is, at one point, they did a medley of songs. And the medley of songs were really a medley of old songs and new songs. They were just upbeat church songs. Okay. And, and, and it was amazing to see the body of Christ respond to it. That you, it, it didn't matter what you had, you had young and old persons up clapping their hands, young and old persons celebrating and praising God. Uh, it, it was just a beautiful thing. And yes, we are, I am making every attempt to get him back because it, 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 let me also say, it felt good to be able to stay in my own lane. You know what I'm saying? My, 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 my lane is really not singing. Yeah. And so it felt good to be able to pour all the energy into preaching and being a pastor. Okay. And and I mean, now I'm still tired, which is a good thing. That means we got it all on the field. But still, it was not having to split energy between being pray, praise and worship leader and pastor. Well, and those are some of the things that I said to you mm -hmm. when you started. Yes. Don't try to do admitting it. Right. Kinds of things. Right. You know, there are certain, as you prepare mm -hmm. to bring us a message, mm -hmm. I don't know if you had time <laughs> if we talked about Sunday school. Right, right. And then now we talk about. But we need to try to build. I understand that the two people who were sort of notified about uh, the music. Um, from Dr. Mills. Mm -hmm. I don't know when you got that email. Uh, yeah, I got, I got the email, yes. And yes. basically it was, to my understanding, just to try to pull together, together. Right. Mm -hmm. some things that can enhance our worship service. Our worship, even mm -hmm. including getting someone back on the choir. Right, exactly, exactly. And In fact, that's the move. Let them help. The amen. Praise God. Service. Praise right. God. Praise God. Well, this is, it, 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 the more I think about this kind of thing, I, I, I think about you uh -huh. as a senior pastor, mm -hmm. but trying to maybe do uh, a whole lot of chewing. Right. <laughs> you need to <laughs> I, I, I got you. I got you. But uh, maybe it's good to be you talk. Um, Amen. Then we can talk in, in, in this uh, in the Friday, in the setting. Right. Um, but I just think as we talk about this coming Sunday and mm -hmm. the Sunday's following that, right. I think it would be real good uh -huh. based on what I hear. Amen. It People will be. were excited. Yes, they were. Yes, they were. I was excited, and I am still excited. And we, and we want we want to move ahead and, and and secure that and make that a more regular part of our service. Okay. Uh, amen. So and and, and 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 to that degree, let me also say this because I I have said it a couple times. In fact, you weren't here when I said it. I have now started taking Mondays off okay. because what happened? I realized I'm here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday. Right. The only day I'm not here is Friday. And then when you think about it, everyone, no matter where we work, they get two days off. They get Saturday and Sunday most of the time. You know, we work Monday to Monday. And so as uh, uh, Dr. Wilmina well, said, you know, you know, we didn't expect you to be here six or seven days a week. We expected yeah. you to take some time. And so, and I shared with persons that when I took that first Monday, it was almost like, you know how you, how you slink down on the couch, like, woo! And so I realized just how much I needed that rest. Right. And, you know what I'm saying? So I, I say all that and say, yes, we are starting to do things uh, that are, that hopefully will preserve me for the long run, but also will, will build and sustain that excitement mm -hmm. that we had. Amen. And so, uh, don't worry. Like I said, we're, I'm talking to the young ladies to get them to come back. They said they want to come back. We just got to get on their schedule. And 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 here's a beautiful thing. Um, uh, Sunday, 
Since Sunday, I've gotten more calls from members saying, Pastor, what can I do to help bring them back? So it's it's it is we're gonna stay on this, we're gonna stay on this this exciting curve or, or wave that we're on so that we can take this just from a one-time thing to make this more permanent. And again, I think it'll be a good thing. I think it'll be a blessed thing. And I and again it, it gives us something different to look forward to to come come to church on Sunday. You know, you know, so we, we're doing it. Trust me. I, I'm so far. I, 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 know you, I know you probably are, but even internally, mm -hmm. without getting right from out there, right, right, we're going to start thinking about what can we do internally. Amen, amen, amen. To, to make people excited about to, it. To uh, mm -hmm. help. With some of the roles Amen. in our uh, play. Amen. And, uh, you, you say that's not your thing, not your lane. Uh, let's find some people. Who it is, Amen. Who they live in. Right. Amen. So they can Amen. Amen. We, we are. We okay. are. We are. We are. Amen. Amen. So let's do this. Let's see if we can. You and I, we can finish these last eight slides, seven, eight slides, okay. and then we can jump into our discussion, uh, begin our discussion on, uh, on the Old Testament book of Genesis. As you know, in our study, we've been looking at the posture of prayer. We've gone through the definition of prayer. We've gone through how many times it's in the Bible. We've gone through specific types of prayers in the Bible. Now we're at the end of our study. We're looking at postures of prayer. And one of the things we've said is, Prayer can and should be performed in any position. There is no one correct posture. However, what we are doing is going through looking at postures that we do see in the Bible. And one of the postures we see is sitting. That person was sitting and having prayer. That they were sitting down as they were having a two-way communication with God about what it is they need and what God is and, and what God is uh, expecting from them. We saw persons standing and praying. Okay, we've seen people kneeling and praying. Uh, last week, uh, last two weeks, we looked at people laying prostrate. That's laying one's face to the ground uh, and praying. And today we're going to look at praying with our hands lifted up. All right. Uh, in fact, let's let's go. Amen. To Ezra, the Old Testament book of Ezra, chapter nine, verses four through six. It's on the board. The New Living Translation reads. Then all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel came and sat with me because of this outrage committed by the returned exiles. And I sat there utterly appalled until the time of the evening sacrifice. At the time of the sacrifice, I stood up from where I sat, I sat in the morning, from where I sat in morning with my clothes torn. I fell to my knees and I lifted up my hands to the Lord my God. I prayed, O oh my God, I am utterly ashamed. I blush to lift, my lift up my face to you, for our sins are piled higher than our heads, and our guilt has reached the heavens. Amen. You see here that he, even though he's on his knees, kneeling, he has lifted up his hands in prayer. That's When you see people lift up their hands in prayer, that's a form of submission. That, that's literally almost like giving yourself to God, like God. I, I, I'm just giving me to you for you to do whatever you want to do. In fact, this is, we see small children, they lift their hands up to us to pick, be picked up because they're, they're really giving themselves to us to pick them up. And so here it is, uh, Ezra, the prophet, is lifting his hands to God and he's praying to God. Amen. First Timothy chapter 9, verses 4 through, uh, verses 8. I don't know, okay, I didn't change that. That may not be, no, there's no chapter 9 in verse Timothy. Okay, it's chap that's 1 Timothy chapter 1. That's a typo, I'm sorry. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. In every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands, lifted up to God, free from anger and controversy. This is Paul instructing Timothy how to lead prayer. And he's, he's, he's basically saying, I want men, I want Christians submitted to God, giving their all to God, that this posture of, Raising hands is a process of giving yourself away, giving it all to God. He said, I want persons to worship God in spirit and truth, and I want I want them to worship God free from anger, free from controversy. 
In other, in other words, free from the messes that we make. You know how we, sometimes in our interaction with a person, we can really make some, some really bad messes. Uh, and free from anger, free from jealousy, free from envy, free from those things that take us out of the character of God. Uh, amen. Amen. Okay. Well, let's, I, I forgot about the methodology of prayer. <laughs> amen. Praise God. This is why we have it up here. The methodology of prayer. How do we properly engage in prayer? That's the question. For someone, this is what I get a lot of times. When I tell them people, I would have you pray. Well, Pastor, how do I know how to pray? How do I engage in the methodology of prayer? Other than the Lord's Prayer in Matthew and Luke, the Bible doesn't provide any instruction on how to pray. And I don't think that's an accident. I think that's intentional. Because I think God doesn't want us to get into one routine of praying. Because you know what happens when we, get, when we make anything of God a routine? We stop feeling it. We stop caring. We stop doing it because we want to. We do it because we have to do it. All right? In fact, growing up, when I was a child, I knew that I had to go to church. And for my mom used to say, you determine your week, your Monday through Saturday, by what you do on Sunday mornings. It wasn't necessarily that I wanted to go to church. I wanted to stay in the bed. But I also wanted to go to the football game. I also wanted to go to the party. I also wanted to go to the movies. And I knew my mama was not playing. When she said, you determine your week, your Monday through Saturday, by what you do on Sunday, all right? But that didn't mean I wanted to do it. It just became a routine. Is that what, what my mom said? I'm so impressed. You get up and go to church all the time. I said, because you made me go to church. I said, I, I said I'd rather stay here, eat Cocoa Puffs, and watch cartoons on Sunday. But I don't want to go. Mm -hmm. But because you have pretty much, the, uh, in a backhanded kind of way, Said if I don't go to church, I can't go do what I want to do. It's, it's so it's routine. But here's the thing: God didn't want it to be routine. God, God doesn't want it to be routine. God wants you to do it because you want to do it, because you have a love to do it. And I think that's why He does not provide us with any particular way to pray, instruction to pray. I think. Go ahead, brother. I'm going to say, as I was growing up. Uh, I recall asking my mother uh -huh. uh, about prayer mm -hmm. and uh, about praying. Mm -hmm. And I asked her, and as a young man, she told me, son, you start off by acknowledging Amen. who the power belongs to and the Lord is. Amen. And then you make your request. Amen to God as far as what you wish for, what you right. hope for. Um, I'm saying this because there are a lot of adults, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even in our church, yes. <laughs> who wonder, uh, who have this fear. Mm -hmm. A praying yes. in an open setting. Yes. And one is, you know, it makes it easy for me as I think about what my mother said. Right. You acknowledge right. God. Right. With as much admiration right. and, and acc acclamation yes. um, about Him. Right. And then let's talk about what our wants, what our needs are, Amen. and um, it's just that kind of thing. So it's not that there is something definitive about uh, how you pray, mm -hmm. but it makes it easier for those maybe who don't know. Right. Gives them something like a an outline. A, an outline. Or mm -hmm. it gives them, uh, if we talk about methodology, it gives them something that they can begin to start with. Right. And once you start with it, right. God takes, God Amen. takes over. Amen. In fact, you know, I'm glad you said that because that that is a that is one way to pray. Uh, what I try to tell people is just simply tell them what's on your heart. In fact, I say this like this. I say it to this all the time. I said, 
when you go to the bar to watch a game with your boys, do you need a forum, format to talk to your boys? They're like, no, we just start talking. So when you go hang out with your girls, you go have brunch. Do you need, no, we, we start talking before we even get there. I said, no. I said, the problem is we have this view of God. It, our view of God is so exalted and so ethereal that what we fail to remember is God is an approachable God. That yeah. God is a, is a kind of God that he can literally sit at the same table here and say, here, here's a cup of coffee. Let's share coffee. Let's talk. And so I like that because that is a way for, like you said, for folks who have who either have a fear or don't have the knowledge of prayer of how to begin praying. Yeah. Um, but like for me, sometimes when I pray to God, I'm like, I don't want anything. I just want, like you said, acknowledge who you are. Mm -hmm. I just want to glorify you for who you are. I just want to spend this time just thanking you for being who you are. And then other, other times I'm like, God, you know what? I'm starting this, but I'm going to be quiet because I need to hear you. You know, mm -hmm. and so th if, if this is what what this is why we use the definition that we did, because many times we grew up understanding that prayer was bowing your head, steeping in your hands, kneeling on your knees, and saying you say your prayer. And that's the only way you can do it. <laughs> right, right, right. That exactly. If you didn't, I can remember my grandma. If you don't close your eyes. <laughs> you know, oh, so you, you bow your head. They they were upset because you 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 didn't do it that way. But but again, when we take a very close look at the Bible, prayer isn't just that. There are times when we see that, but more time than not, we see God and His people interacting, communicating, and in that time. In fact, I was sharing last week with folks. And folks were looking at me cross-eyed when I said, I said, do y'all remember when Abraham, both Abraham and Moses had to convince God not to be a bad God? And they were going to be like, when was he a bad God? When he was thinking about wiping these folks out. Yeah. And, and they had to intercede no, with, no, no, no. right, right. They had to intercede with God for God not to get beside his character. Mm -hmm. That basically, like hey, Moses said, what kind of God are you that brings these people out into the wilderness to kill them? Is that what you, how you want people to look at you? That's the kind of fear you want people to have of you. And, and, it, and, it, and it brought God back from a place that clearly he didn't want to be. Amen. Uh, but, but again, that was prayer. That was prayer. That had nothing to do with Moses' request. That had everything to do with the people and God's reputation. There are other times where, where here, here's the thing. Remember when uh, uh, Jacob is wrestling with God? And the, and the God says, all let night. me go all night. And he and, and he's said, I'm not letting you go till you bless me. Believe it or not, that's praying. Yeah. That's praying. Yeah. And so, that's why I'm saying there's really no, there is instruction because all, anytime we read the Bible, the Bible provides instruction. So let me change that term now. There is instruction. Because if you read the Bible, you'll see how people pray. What I am saying, there is no one approved method, method of prayer. Yeah. When, what particular way to pray? Just like there's not one particular posture to pray, there's no one particular prayer, particular prayer type of way to pray. But there is the Lord's prayer. This is interesting because this prayer, this is a prayer that Jesus gave the disciples in response to their request. Teach us how to pray. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting, uh, and, I, and I think that's a, for me personally, I think that's amazing because here it is. These past, in the past, these characters have had access to God. They've heard his voice. They've interacted with him. But no one has stopped to say, God, before you leave, teach me how to pray. Mm -hmm. Amen. So let's look at this. Two what versions of this. All right. So I want us to look at the two, two different versions of the Lord's Prayer. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 18. And then we're going to look, look at Luke 11. I want us to see that the, 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 there are small differences, but I think there are significant differences. Differences. It read the New Living tra Translation of Matthew chapter six, verses five through eighteen reads as follows: When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I, t I tell you the truth: that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. 
For your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask Him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the, today the food we need. And forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sinned against us. And do not let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. If you, will, if you forgive those who sinned against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. And when you fast, do not make it obvious, as the hypocrites do. For they try to look miserable and disheveled, so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, this, that is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face. And no one will notice that you're fasting except your father, who knows what you do in private. And your father, who sees everything, will reward you. Amen. So, let, let's look at a couple of things here. Uh, what Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 18 teaches us about, how, about praying and how to pray. One in Matthew chapter 6, we learned that prayer isn't a public display of personal piety. This is, when we pray, this is not the chance for you to demonstrate how saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost Spirit that you are. Instead, prayer is a private moment for the Lord and us to interact, commune, fellowship, and share with each other. In fact, I, I, I analogize this to a relationship between a husband and wife. It's okay when I see some forms of PDA public displays of fashion, but most I don't like to see that. I might take that somewhere. Go, go, because I don't. That's for the two of you. I really don't need to see you hugged up, tongue kissing on the bench out there waiting to go to church. I don't care about holding hands. I don't care about you having your arms around each other. But all this messy public, that's unnecessary. If to me it seems like this just to pass out that when I see people do that, what you're trying it to me it feels like you're trying to convince me that things are better than what they really are. There's an old saying that if you're something, you don't have to tell anyone that you're some that thing. You just are. If you're the boss, you have to keep saying, I'm the boss. People know you're the boss. If you're the parent, you have to keep telling the kids, I'm the parent. The kids know you're the parent. If you have to keep saying it or keep doing it, you're telling me or just demonstrate to me that you're not what you're doing. And so, same thing here. If I've got to keep letting you see my Christian membership card for you to know that I'm a Christian, if I've got to keep talking about, oh, it's a wonderful to get in the corner of God and pray, no, that's my time, that's my private time. In fact, if you shared uh, a while ago, you say, you know, you have your time when you go in the bathroom, you close the door, and that's just you and God. I don't need to know what, what you and God talk about. I just need to know that you and God are spending time. And I need, and, and the way I know it is by seeing how it's reflected in your life. All right? I, in fact, I remember this one pastor. Uh, whenever a guest preacher would come, and we can, oh, oh, okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead I'll keep going. I, I, I'll keep it uh, going. We have guests watching us on the, uh, on the tablets. Uh, I remember this one preacher that whenever a guest preacher would come and blow the house down, I mean, with the awesome dynamite, uh, this one preacher would come behind the dynamite uh, guest preacher and basically preach a mini sermon in the prayer he would he would pray afterwards. And I, me personally, in my spirit, it didn't feel necessary to do all that. But what it came across was that this individual felt intimidated by the guest preachers, which is ironic because he's the one who invited the guest preachers to his house. You know, if, if you are afraid that someone's going to come in your house and cook a better dinner to you, then this is what you do. You don't invite them to your house to come cook dinner. You invite them to come eat, but you don't invite them to come cook. And so. Uh, he would go on and on with these mini sermons and his prayers and just be wasting time uh, uh, trying to prove to the rest of us that he had the ability, he was worthy of, of, of our respect. And that, was, that wasn't necessary. That, that wasn't necessary at all. So saying that prayer is not a public display of personal piety, Instead, it is a private moment for the Lord and us 
you and the Lord, me and the Lord, in our time, a private moment for us to interact, commune, fellowship, and share with one another. All right? Amen. Prayer is also purposeful, exact, and succinct. It's purposeful, exact, and succinct. Let me help you get this. That when we pray, we pray on purpose. You just don't pray to be praying. When we communicate with God, we're communicating with God and fellowship with God on purpose. We are seeking something out of it. Even if we don't quite know what it is, when we say, Lord, speak to me, we are expecting God to speak to something that we're dealing with. And we're expecting him to do it right now, to do it immediately. All right? It's exact. We ain't mixing words. You know, uh, uh, I, one of my daughters, uh, when she asks me for stuff, she tends to beat around the bush. Well, oh, Daddy, I was thinking it possibly could I. Da, da, da. And I'm like, what is it that you want? Just ask me what it what is what. And, but, Daddy, I'm just not sure if, nah, you're not going to get it if you keep dragging on and on and on and on. Just tell me exactly what it is you want. Do you want the cake or not? Do you want the doll or not? Do you want to go here or not? I don't need all that. In fact, I tease my mother. When my mother calls me and asks me to do something, it comes with a story. It may tell that to cut off some amount of time for a 30 minute story. Just ask me what you want. Be exact. Same thing with, with God. We should not be beating around the bush. We should not be uh, uh, delaying uh, and, 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 and uh, what, what, what's the term? I'm trying to use the term is not a bad word. But we, we shouldn't be uh, uh, beating around the bush about what we want. We should get right to it. And our prayer should be succinct. Have anyone ever been around someone that prays so long that y'all forgot what y'all were there praying for? God rest my grandmother's soul, but that was her. Thanksgiving prayers, Thanksgiving dinner prayers went on about everything but Thanksgiving. My grandmother prayed so long that imagine this table is our family. And so what she what she she'll be at the head praying, my aunt will be on the other side. And she, my girl, Prince wanted my aunt would start moving around the outside of the circle to get the grandma so that she could pinch grandma on her elbow to tell her to, to wrap it up. To stop going on and on, stop performing. Many times I see folks uh, praying, and many of their prayers could have lasted a minute and 10 seconds, not the 10 minute prayer they give. That's because they think by going on, being long winded, that they are actually demonstrating more piety than anything. That's why I love a child's prayer. When you put a child in prayer, thank you for my mama, thank you for my daddy, thank you for my brother and my sister, thank you for the dog, thank you for all my friends, and thank you for my teacher, goodbye. That's how a child prays. And if we could just pray like that, we would find ourselves uh, in a much better place because what happens, we get right to the meat of it. And what happens, we, we actually release God to do what he's going to do sooner and quicker because we aren't wasting his time with these long, <coughs> excuse me, these long drawn out, uh, <coughs> beating around the bush, unnecessarily long prayers. Amen. Prayer. This is another thing that we learned from Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 13. <coughs> excuse me. Prayer is supposed to enable the Lord to assign to us and direct us when performing discipleship and stewardship assignments. Prayer is supposed to enable the Lord to assign to us and direct us when performing discipleship and stewardship assignments. Remember, if we go back to our definition of prayer. One of the things prayer does it prayer allows us to bring our concerns, our issues, our problems, our worries to God just as they are. But what happens typically is when once we have brought our prayers, our concerns, our issues, our problems to God, 
God then redirects us to go over there to help someone else who's dealing with an issue, a care, a concern, or a problem. And many we talked about many times how it feels like God has ignored us. And it's not, remember, it's not that God has ignored us. God is already on the scene and dealing with the issues that affect us. What God wants us to do is stop putting our, putting our energy in to uh, ourselves and put our energy into our neighbors. Remember the story of the one-handled spoon, you know? Those persons that were big and fat in their house were the ones that understood that it was better to feed one another than it was to try to feed yourself because in feeding one another, all your needs were taken care of. So again, prayer uh, uh, it, 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 it's, it's supposed to enable God. It's supposed to be the avenue or the doorway or the medium upon which God can speak directly to us and direct us and guide us and counsel us and instruct us and remind us and empower us to be able to do those things that he has called us to do. Amen, 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 amen. Well, all right, well, we are at the end, amen, of our, uh, of our lesson on prayer. Amen, praise God. And let's do this. Let's switch over now to our uh, lesson to start Genesis. Amen. Is it up there? Amen. Praise God. Our lesson here, uh, Genesis, the beginning of God's love relationship with us. Amen. Genesis, the beginning of God's love relationship with us. Amen. Uh, well, let's look at um, and, and, well, let's look at Genesis as an analysis. Let's analyze Genesis as a legal, a literary work, a historical record, and a theological perspective. And I think we need to do this before we jump into the actual scriptures of Genesis. Because the book Genesis, we consider it as the first book of the Bible, and it is. But it's much, much more than that, and it really begins, Genesis begins to put into writing and to describe for us the love that God has for us. Amen. Amen. We're starting our study on Genesis. Genesis is the beginning of God's love relationship with us. And we're going to look at it to begin with as a literary work, a historical record, and a theological perspective. Uh, we're going to jump into the meat of the scripture, but I want to give you some background on Genesis so that as we're reading Genesis and moving through it, we can better understand why there are why some of the things are the way that they are. Okay? Go ahead, Doc. Yeah. Um, to my understanding, uh, Genesis was written by Moses. <laughs> Supposedly, when the people in um, Babylon mm -hmm. were quite concerned by how all this started anyway. Right. Well, that was the question that they had. That, that that's 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 a that that is a theory. In fact, what we're going to learn is that we know that the the Bible as we have it, especially the Old Testament as we have it, was not written until the Babylonians were, were ransacked and sacking all of Israel. Israel's history is an oral history. It was one where um, you know now that you've attained the status you have, you're you're older, you're retired. No one had any more expectations of you other than to now start transmitting the stories of Israel to the family. So each day at dinner, after we finished dinner, we would gather around you for you to tell us the story. And so your job as the patriarch of the family was to do one thing. Each evening to tell you how to cook food, you had to hunt, you had to do anything. Just tell us a story. And until the Babylonians came, no one thought about reducing it to right. It wasn't until when they came that the Israelites really became fearful that they may not survive. And you know their identity is tied into their history of Yahweh. And so what happened, the kings, the religious elite, the priests, everyone began a mass effort to write down all the stories they could. They didn't have time to redact them. They didn't have time to say, okay, I like your version better than this. What they did, they wrote it all down, they smushed it together in a book, and they hid, hid it into the temple as it was being destroyed. This is why later on, I think it's Nehemiah or Jeremiah, 
finds the book of the law in the temple. It's under all it's under all the rubble. They're rebuilding the temple. And they're they're joyful because now they've their history, their legacy with God has been restored because they have this book. And what the first thing God makes the king do, he makes the king read the book from beginning to ending in the presence of all the people so that they can remember who they are and their history of God. But the earliest manuscripts we have date back to about 485 to 475 BCE, what we call before the Christian experience, before Christ. Before that, we don't really have too many written manuscripts. And the interesting thing about the Old Testament manuscripts that's different from the Greek New Testament is the amount of care that the Israelites went through to make sure there's Old Testament, these Old Testament books survived. Not only did they have like a number page, so each they knew the, their, their canon was 1,200 pages. On each page, each word had a number. And by the end of the page, there should have been a certain number of words by the end of the page. So if you were recopying the, the Bible, the Old Testament, and we got to page 36, and on page 36 we should have 554 words, and we got 574 words, they would throw that copy out because they knew there should only be 554 words on that page. So the Jews were very meticulous in keeping their transcripts. And, and, be, and because of that meticulousness, because of the amount of effort they put in there, archaeologists have been able to confidently argue that up, that up to this point, there was no writing. But once it got reduced to writing, they, they were on it. And they did not, they, they did not play about, reduce, about, re, about how they was copied, even redacting it. They, it was very strict rules. Now, the Greek New Testament is something else. These are really just letters that have been collected together for the most part, other than the Gospels. The epistles are just letters. In fact, we were talking about this uh, 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 last week in the evening session. First, we know 1 Corinthians is not the first letter to the Corinthians. Because Paul starts off saying, as I wrote to you in a previous letter. So there is another letter, what, what, what we would really, really in, 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 in biblical uh, analysis and in historic, his, biblical history, 1 Corinthians is really a combination of two letters. We believe it's a combination because in the, in the middle, the language and the, and the terminology starts changing. And then the second Corinthian is really a fourth letter. And then there's this first letter that we're not sure if it's been blended in with first Corinthians or it existed by itself. But what happened at 323 AD, the Council of Nicaea came together and they decided on what they thought should be in the canon. Anything that they thought went against God's portrayal of Jesus as the, uh, as the sin appropriation was kept out. So, like for example, during this time there were a whole lot of Gospels. One of the more famous ones is the Gospel of Peter. It got kept out of uh, Peter. Peter, Gospel of Peter. Okay. Peter's Gospel got kicked out for two primary reasons. The first reason is Peter records a Jesus that's vengeful. He records stories where Jesus gets upset with people and spikes them strikes them down in power and then what happened he realized that he should not have done it and he goes back and resurrects him the church fathers had a problem with that because they had this this whole view that jesus is god jesus is god's representation of love so how how does spiting people with his power represent love here's another problem this was the bigger problem was that in peter's gospel Jesus marries Mary Magdalene and they have sexual intercourse. And see, if you go back to Leviticus, when you have the guilt and sin offering, the first thing it requires is an animal that's sin-free, blemish-free, fault-free. And the whole idea is that someone that has had sexual intercourse is no longer blemish-free. And so they so they they strenuously argued against God Peter's gospel from being in the in in the canon that we have now because of those two reasons. Mm -hmm. All right? Uh, there, there's a gospel of Thomas. There's a gospel of Mary. Uh, Magdalene. Gospel of Mary. Mother of Jesus. Never made it into the canon. Never made it canon. 
some of these didn't make it in because at that time they knew that the authorship occurred way after the uh, disciples had died. Now we have to remember by 70 AD, all the disciples and Paul are dead. So any work that's coming later is subject to high scrutiny. The, the, the interesting thing is that how did the Gospel of John get in there? Yeah, because we, we know John's Gospel is not written to 100 to 125 AD. Now, the speculation is this. When you look at the Gospel of John and then first and some second John, what you see is a consistency in the writing. And what you discern is this person, if their name is John, they're not the disciple John, they're a disciple of the disciple John. And so what happened, the, art, the belief is that the author of the Gospel of John is one of the disciple John's very first students. And he has, he is now an old man. Uh oh. He, he is now, an, maybe I'm hitting the cord, I'm sorry. He is now an old man. And what he's doing, he's recording all the lessons that his teacher taught him. This is why the Gospel of John is such an extended doxology. It's really a praise book. Jesus does no wrong. Jesus knows everything. No, no enemy confront Jesus. Jesus goes to the, goes to the cross cheerful. Well, <coughs> the Gospel of John, as he's going to Revelation, uh, he sees he, this old man now, 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 here's the funny thing. The argument is that John on Patmos is more likely to disciple John. That the, the argument, the, the biggest argument is that that John is not the John that wrote the Gospel of, 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 of John. That's the, that's the teacher that taught that John to write, that, that taught him everything, that ends up writing the Gospel. That that John is on Patmos, that on the Patmos, is probably the disciple. Here's the problem. Then how did he get? How did he get the the God, his his apocalypse off the island? Because he's on a he's he's left there on an the island by himself. Yeah. See, but see, he's supposed to write it down. Right. He's supposed to, yeah. He's supposed to write it down. So so once he wrote it down, who did he give it to to get it off the island? Because he was restricted to the island. I thought he came back to um one of those. He came back to. He was brought off the island of Patmos. Because of the old age and uh -huh. what they considered senility. Senility. Oh, I, I, w I wasn't aware of that. I, I, I wasn't aware and of that. And they brought him back. It, 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 I'm trying to think of the name of one of the churches after. Uh, I see, uh, it, it, it's Samaria, it, Ephesus, Thessalonica. Eph I think e Ephesus. Ephesus. Okay, Ephesus. Came back to Ephesus. Uh, and there, he supposedly finished. Now, as, a, as a senile person, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, but back to Genesis. Yeah, back to Genesis. Uh, first five books are written by. That that's the argument. That the the authorship is attributed to. In fact, we're going to talk about. It. We're going to talk about that. Okay. Gonna, well, I don't want. I don't want to get it. Yeah, you're, you're okay. You're okay. But again, every study Bible you pick up, the first thing they say is the first five books Moses wrote them. And, and we're going to talk about, about that. But let, let me work my way there. Because, right. <laughs> amen, amen. Genesis, the name of the book, book got its name from the very first words written in the first chapter. The very first words are in the beginning. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, in the beginning is not translated Genesis. All right? In the beginning is translated Bereshit. Amen. Uh, it, in, in the beginning, it's translated Bereshit. I've given you uh, the English alliteration of the word. That's not the Aramaic way of, of spelling it. But this word, Bereshit, is, it translates in the beginning. All right? So, if you were to pick up a, uh, a, a Jewish Bible, all right, written in Aramaic, the Aramaic doesn't say Genesis. It says in the beginning. And for the fact, the first five books take their titles from the, from the words that describe the opening first few words of the books. So Exodus, the, the, the really, the word Exodus is what the Greeks have given it. There's another word for that, for that book. 
Same thing with Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Really, the, what we have as in English really are the result of Greek of Greeks getting a hold of the Aramaic Jewish Old Testament, converting it to Greek, and then Greek, Greek, it was spread out. Greek was what English is now. It was the universal language. Everyone spoke it. And so uh, what we have now really are derivatives of Greek interpretations of the Aramaic. But the, the, the Bible, the name of the, the first book in the Old Testament scripture is Bereshit, or in the beginning. That's what how Jews would understand that. Um, and, and the Jewish, uh, again, it wasn't Genesis. Uh, uh, so we go down. In the Torah. In the, in, the to in, 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 in the Torah, Bereshit is the name of the book. Like, 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 yeah, yeah, like, like if you were to go and talk to a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, and say, hey, can I see what, how your version of Genesis read that they're going to tell you we don't have a book named Genesis. We have a book named Bereshit. Genesis is a name, it's Genesis is a name, if I was getting, uh, uh, tell you, it's a name that the Greeks gave. In fact, in fact, the practice of naming the books by the first few First few words is a Near East tradition, and it doesn't originate with Israelites. It's just the, the tradition that of that time. All right, we we get the name Genesis when the Septuagint was written. Okay, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and it, and, the, and you have to know a little history of this word Septuagint. Septuagint. Septua means seventy. Okay. You add the prefix that that gent is really it really means seventy writers. And what happened? Alexander the Great, upon conquering the Near East, uh, what he would do? He would bring the customs that he cust he con conquered into his courts. So he was hearing these Jewish rabbis and priests talk about their God. He, and that's another. He let them keep their gods. And he was very interested in the stories that he was hearing them talk about. All right, so this I, when you were telling the story, I think what has happened somehow down the line, the story has gotten you know as we tell the story, we, we tell it changes his historically. He is hearing this. He's hearing them talk about it, and he wants to engage them. They tell him, well, there's not really anything in writing for us to give you because you're not you. He said, well, this is what I want you to do. I want each of you to get with 70 separate scribes. And what I want you to do is tell them the stories as best you recollect. And then at the end, we'll, put our, we'll see what they look like and mesh all 70 together. The legend is that when Alexander the Great and his scribes looked at all 70 transcripts, from this, from the, from these priests sharing their stories, they read exactly the same. There was not one word that was different. There was not one comma that was out of place. There was not one period. The whole idea that the early church took was that had to be God. Because think about it, you and me could be sitting here and a and a plane crashes on that side of the building. You know we're not going to tell that story the same way. Because guess what? We're gonna we gonna we 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 we're gonna embellish it differently. Plus we see things differently. That, that's why when I when I when I when I was practicing all heavy and it was a case where the the, the convention hung on an eyewitness identification, I love those. Especially you have multiple people. Because then you say, What did you see? What were they wearing? Well he was wearing a, a green polka dot sweater with an orange hat. Somebody else like it was an orange sweater with a green polka dot hat. Someone else. No, it was a purple jacket with an orange and green striped hat. No one sees it the same. But here it is when Alexander the Great asked the, the, these priests to, redact, to recite and these scribes write it down. 70 exactly the same copy. That's how we get the uh, get a Greek version of the Old Testament. And from, and from that, uh oh, my power source, uh oh, did it? Uh-oh, is this turned off? Lord have mercy. Yeah, it's plugged up, but folks that uh, broke it down for me turned the, turned the, uh, the thing off. Oh. It, it's fine now. But so when 
these authors were writing, these Greek, these Greek scribes chose the word uh, Genesis. It, it, it's it's gene, genesis. It, it is not pronounced quite Genesis, but, it, but it's, it's a translation. Now, the word Genesis means origins. What are origins but beginnings? So what happens, we have a word that's really a an analytical translation of the Greek word Bereshit, all right? So that's how we get Genesis. Because those scribes said, okay, if the book is called In the Beginning, in our language, the beginning is always an origin, so we're gonna call it Genesis, all right? Now, uh, and, 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 what we, and what we've done, we, we in English, have substituted the word beginning for origin because typically the origin is the beginning. In English, we like to make one word mean a lot of things. In other languages, one word means one thing. And it's to mean a new beginning, a new start. A new start, right. Right. Or a start period. Yeah. Now, if, if, in fact, that's why for, uh, we haven't had our, our, our church conference yet, so we can vote on this, why the mission statement for us is read Genesis. A new start, starting over again. That here it is. We've had a chance to do it, and for whatever reason, it happened the way it happened. But now God is trying to do a new thing, a new beginning, a new a regenesis. Uh, amen. Uh, Genesis speaks to several desires. Okay, let me listen them for you. The scientist's fascination with the birth of the cosmos and the origin of life on Earth. Every scientist want to know how did it start. And here's the thing, you know, we have, you know the reason why the Big Bang Theory came about? Because there was a group of scientists that refused to believe that one entity created one man and one woman and everyone came from that. So, so really the Big Bang Theory comes, uh, especially during, it really comes during the Industrial Revolution. And it comes at a time because we, what we don't realize is that up to the Industrial Revolution, science and religion really walked hand in hand. There really was no distinction that many scientists were priests and many priests were scientists. When the Industrial Revolution happens beginning in the late 1600s, the middle 1600s on to about beginning the, about to the Civil War or the end of the Civil War, uh, probably even earlier than that. So you know, the Industrial Revolution is probably, probably closer to when, when Columbus came here, came here. so they're doing industry. So let's say about 1450s to about the end of the 1800s. There is a move to divorce science from religion. And so what happens, the, the, the scientists, in fact, a little lesson for folks, the term Illuminati is a term, is, is from the word where we get illumination, which is to make bright or to reveal. The Illuminati were scientists who believed that because science, because science was so married to religion, that that science that you didn't have a pure science, a science that stood apart from this idea of a one supreme entity or being creating everything. So the Illuminati really, and I hate when these young people use it, is really the scientists that have, have branched away. And they, they're, they're trying to divorce religion from science, all right? Uh, so, but, uh, but like um, the Roman, I'm not the Roman, but the um, Catholic. See, uh, the, 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 Dan Brown, I don't know if he's Catholic or not, he's created a story that, that he's, but, but the, his version of Illuminati is incorrect because he basically is creating this, this secret society that's trying to keep uh, certain truths about Jesus hidden. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that the gold that the uh, gold chalice or, or, or the chalice of Christ is not a, a, a cup, it's a person. Mm -hmm. they, they, he's, he's picking up on this argument from the Gospel of Peter that Mary and Jesus were married. Yeah. And so, but the problem is his, his book is more fiction than fact. Uh, but the Illuminati really were just scientists who, who at the time were like, we do not believe 
that science is, is as married to as religion as possible, that we don't believe that there's this one God that created people. We started, we had, we, and from that we get the Big Bang Theory, that there had to be two atoms that collided and when they collided, they, they expanded exponentially in one second, in, in part of a second, and in essence started building, and all the building blocks of life were there. Now the question that the Big Bang theorists uh, uh, still are stumped with is, who created the two atoms? Mm -hmm. chicken yeah, which came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> and and, and it, it, it's a good question. But here's the thing, Genesis, believe it or not, Every scientist, even those of the Big Bang Theory, start with Genesis. Because to, to prove something, you have to disprove something else. So what they're trying to disprove is Genesis. All right? It's the anthropologist's anthropologist curiosity about the first human beings. What we're like. This is also where those anthropologists that believe that we develop, we devolve from monkeys, that we are the we are some type of primate that has evolved over time. Uh, th they start here in Genesis because there are scientists trying to disprove this idea that we were born human. That we must have been something else. That they have looked at other animals and see the progression of development, and they have argued that because we're animals, we too must have had a progression of development. All right. The historian's interest in the beginning of civilization. I'm a political scientist by major. And, and my, I spent four years discussing how the civilization has come about. Who? I've read a lot. Thoreau, Adams, uh, all these people who, wrote, who spent their time, and I think they wasted their time, arguing about the beginnings of civilization and why man came together to create civilizations in the first place. But this is right. This Genesis helps us because again, we did look at Genesis from a purely political scientist aspect. The family's esteem of its earliest ancestors. Who are we? Where do we come from? What can we claim? But you know, back in the early 1900s or the late 1800s, archaeologists found the body of a woman in Africa, her name's Lily. You, I know you know this story. Where it, and it, she, when they dated her, so it's 1900, when they dated her body, it was older than anything else. And it was in Africa. It was in Central Africa. And so that for a lot of us, even if we don't necessarily believe the Bible, a lot of us, a lot of black folks consider ourselves the original man, the original person. And we say that Adam came from us. That Adam was one of us. That's part of this whole desire, this family esteem, to recognize our earliest ancestors. Amen. The theologian's concern about the founding events of religious traditions. For me, as a theologian, I want to know what was it about God that, one, he needed to create us to even begin with. Because if he's Lord God Almighty, there's none like him. He is one. And if we take the position that Jesus and the Holy Spirit were there with them, he had all the company he needed in the world. Why then did he create us? In fact, why, did, why didn't he stop with the angels if he needed company? There's something about the angels that, was, did, that did not theologically fulfill God that he kept going and he created us. In fact, there's a movie called The Prophecy with Christopher Walken. I love it. It's a sci-fi movie. It's totally fiction. None of it's fact. But the premise of the movie is that there is a there was a, remember when Isaiah says, I saw Lucifer cast out of, uh, of heaven mm -hmm. like a burning star and all the demons with him? Well, there was that war. This movie goes on the on the on the story of Gabriel leading a second war that Gabriel, the one that God called upon to destroy civilization and to, to rain down fire, eventually feels underappreciated by God, and he wants to replace God as God. So there's a second war in heaven. And so in this, in this uh, 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 war, uh, the, the humans are caught up in the middle of it, because you have Michael leading the armies of, and God, and Gabriel going against them. But, the, but all the angels call us monkeys. 
and they keep saying, why did God love you so much that he knew you had a monkey or how to talk? And so really what that story does is playing on several different theories of origins. But it's, it's interesting because what you see, you see angels, and what you realize is that one of the story eventually shares is God gave us souls, not angels. Now again, this is fiction, not fact, all right? But, it's, it, but that posits a reason for why God went as far as he did to create us, even after he had created angels and be in heaven with him. That he gave us, that when he breathes us, breathes to us the Ruma or the Numa. Ruma oh, is the Aramaic for spirit or breath. Numa is the Greek word for spirit or breath. Alright? But these are theological concerns about the founding events of our religion and who we are to God and our relationship with him. Even though the early church fathers set Genesis and the Christian canon as a separate individual book, it wasn't originally written as such. So, 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 we're getting, we're, no, so we're getting to your question about Moses, right, mm -hmm. the, the, the first five books. The first five books are really, really written as one long book. What has happened, man has divided up the books so that we can chew and manage it, make it more manageable. That's like the Greek New Testament, there are no numbers, no verse numbers, no chapter numbers. It's a letter. What happened, uh, 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 biblical scholars and, and, and interpreters have, have agreed on certain places where we break certain scriptures up, put a number on it, break up chapters. Same thing, originally Genesis wasn't Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning to the end of, uh, to the end of Deuteronomy. <laughs> that was the first, and so yeah, and so what happens? We have broken up the five books, and in breaking up the five books, now that's how we get to transcribing authorship. Again, we have to remember Genesis as it is is not an independent, complete volume. This is why when you read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they keep talking about uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because the story is still going with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's people. Because you have God appear to Abraham, well, God of creation, then those, then the primeval period, then you have the Abraham on, where every, everything is God's promise to Abraham and realizing with his people. But this, it's really one complete volume. They're not separate books. We have separated them, but they originally were not meant to be separate books. Instead, this long work is the beginning of a long unified story that includes Israel's exodus from Egypt, God's revelation and giving of Torah at Mount Sinai, and Israel's journey through the desert to Canaan. That's what those first five books are about. They're, they're, they're really, if we, and I'm going to show you how it sets up as we move through. Therefore, Genesis must not be read and studied in isolation from the larger story that it's a genuine part of. That here's the thing, when we read Genesis, I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to point you to other places in, in the first five books that are similar to what you're seeing so that you can see that, the, that this particular story is repeated again because it's part of a larger narrative that God is, in, is implementing in, 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 within the uh, within Torah, the first five books of, uh, of the Old Testament. This book is the foundation of the story that follows for the religious experiences narrated in it. This book is the foundation for everything else that happens in the first five books. Uh, now, Genesis is part of a larger group of books called the Pentateuch. All right? The word Pentateuch means five books. All right? The authorship of the Pentateuch has been ascribed to Moses. Pick up any study Bible, they all say the same thing. But there is no clear evidence that Moses was ever the actual author of these books. There is no clear evidence. In fact, I'm going to see if I can walk through. Uh -oh, and I am. Most biblical scholars agree that Moses isn't the author of Genesis or the other four books of the Pentateuch. Now, let me add a point there. Uh huh. And as I understand, but the authorship of the first five books of the uh -huh. Pentateuch 
this was done after the people, the Israelites, had gone to Babylon. And they were raising this question. How did all this get started? What, 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 well, Ash, you got to remember, these are oral stories. Yeah, well, so so, so, so they, they've heard them. And, and the children are asking these questions. The children are asking questions. They're born in Babylon. Yeah, the children that are born in Babylon are asking these questions. all this start. Somebody, and I often say it to myself, uh -huh. Moses couldn't have. Right. No way he could have done because he wasn't in Babylon. Right. At the time. <laughs> He's been dead. He's been dead. Thousands <laughs> of years. <laughs> But it's a scribe. It is. And, and, you, and, and let, let me say something that's different from today than back then. If I wanted to write a book and you had already written the book, I would not write the book in my name. I would write the book as if I was Bill and Miller. Mm -hmm. Because the only way to get published was to show that you had some kind of legacy. Yeah. And so Al, Pastor Al has no legacy. Because I'm just 44 years old. But Dr. McMillan has a long 80 plus year legacy. Yeah. And so I would write in your name. Yeah. Or I would claim that my work, I found this work, and it was really Moses' work, or someone like that, so that then you would publish, you would receive it. But the truth is, none of the works ever tell us who their authors are. Mm -hmm. And then here's another thing. Why would Moses write about himself when he gets there in third person? Mm -hmm. Why, why would he not say, I? Well, I knew, I personally felt that it couldn't have been Moses. No, Moses was dead and gone. <laughs> and plus, plus, here's the thing. If you read these stories, Moses was so busy day in and day out with these Negroes. How did he ever get time to write? His, well, fa his father-in-law comes and shares with him what you share with me. Yeah. That you cannot do it all. That you need some help. And we don't want you to do it all. We don't want you to wear yourself out. You're going to kill yourself. Yeah. Okay. So if, if, if Jethro is coming to share that with Moses, when did the brother ever get time? Yeah. And why do you say my father-in-law instead of saying the father-in-law of Moses? I mean, it, it, doesn't make any, it doesn't make any sense. And what we're going to see is the, when it came time to reduce those stories to writing, there are four groups of authors, four primary group of authors that are responsible for what we have today. All right? They are the priestly group, the Yahweh's group, the Elohist group, and the Deuteronomist. Okay? You know Deuteronomist for Deuteronomy. That's their book. We have no doubt in mind that that's their book. We also think First, first and Second Chronicles is their book too. Reason why? Because the authors of First and Second Chronicles are giving the same stories in First and Second Samuel, First and Second King, but giving it from a perspective of it. Of it not as it's happening, but it already has happened. And you need to relearn from the mistakes that these people made. If you read First and Second Samuel, First and Second King, things are happening in present tense. Mm -hmm. You go to First and Second Chronicle, things go to the past tense. And so the Deuteronomist, Deutero means second or second giving. And so Deuteronomist, Deuteronomy is the second giving of the word. First and Second Chronicles is the second giving of the history of, of Israel's kings and its leaderships. So we think they are ascribed. Uh, like Genesis 1, in the beginning there was nothing, but God said, let there be something. And we have said, that's a, priest, that's a very priestly version, a very ethereal version of God. We attribute that to the priestly group of writers. The, um, uh, the Genesis second Christian story, Genesis chapter 2 and 3, we ascribe that to the Elvis. But here is God who's walking around just like you and me, who's talking and, and breathing, and he's asking questions like, where are you? Because he doesn't know where you are. The Elvis understood that God had the power to resolve whatever, but God was like you and me. He didn't always know what, things, what, what was going on. Mm -hmm. So the reason why he has to ask where are you because he doesn't know where they are mm -hmm. in the garden. And then we have the Yahweh's version, and the Yahweh's version we, anytime in the Bible, such Old Testament, we see the word yeah. Lord, no, the word Lord capitalized, all caps, L-O-R-D, all in caps. That is because uh, the Yahweh's believed that the name of Yahweh was so holy that it, whenever they wanted to say his name, they put in there an Aramaic version of L-O-R-D. And then you have a 
And capital. No, capital. You get, in fact, the new, new international version is good at this. When you read that version, let me see if I can pull, pull a version, but pull that up right quick. When you read that version, whenever they talk about God in, 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 and they say the Lord, I've got, I've got examples of it. I'm going to bring it. We're going to get to it. I mean, well, it's okay. I'm just, and I may be asking you a little more than I need to be asking you. No, no, you're all right. You, you're all right. You're all right. You're all right. Um, uh, okay. Uh, I, I have to find it because now I'm trying to find it on the run. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's all right, but I've, I've got it here. But again, we ascribe authorship to Moses, but again, the books aren't, aren't Genesis written by Moses. That's his written. And, he, and they don't say who it is. So the, the understanding, the belief is that these four groups wrote them. Um, uh, there, there is disagreement, though, about who the actual scholars are. Because there are some times when God is presented in a very womanly manner. And the concern is, well, did a man write that or did a woman write that? There are other times when there are stories that Israel has appropriated from its neighbors. And they're clearly not Israel, Israel, Israelite in nature. They're from other, like the story of Job is not an Israelite story. It's, it's Noah, there's a Mesopotamian story that's just like Noah. Same thing happens. And, 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 and a lot of scholars believe that Israelites borrowed that story from their Mesopotamian neighbors. Uh, I mean, you, we're going to see several stories like that. Uh, the story of, of uh, Jonah is not believed to have been Israelite in nature. They, they believe that that story derives from another, a, another similar story from another neighboring nation and religion. Uh, now, what now? Well, in fact, what time is it? Oh, it's one that I got to stop. Amen. That's my hour and 15 minutes. Amen. We start 15 minutes. Amen. Yeah, brother. I'm, I've learned. I'm learning. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I'm also bringing to the table some of the things. Amen. That I, amen. Um, that, that's what a good Bible study does. Amen. Yeah, amen. 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 That's what a good Bible study does. It allows us not only to learn, but to deal with that which we've been taught. That, you know, the truth is many of us remember Sunday school. And, and the thing is, what we don't realize and what we remember is that Sunday school taught us a very challenged perspective of God. A very, God is good, devil is bad. God never does anything bad, devil always does anything bad. Uh, and so what we have, what many of us are operating on is that, that same youthful Sunday school knowledge when there's really more, greater, more in-depth knowledge for us to get. And I believe that as we go through, you're not, you're not going to be the only one. There will be other people. Because I tell you, in the evening, I was a brother, Sean, when I told him the God didn't know where Adam and Eve were in the garden, he's like, I just cannot accept that. The God, I know that. I said, and I tried to get him to understand. you got to understand, the, the authors of this story were not concerned about whether or not God knew where Adam and Eve were in the garden. They were concerned with explaining how sin was introduced into the human condition and God, how God resolved it. For them, it wasn't a problem that God didn't know where they were. The problem, it would have been a problem if God didn't have the power to fix the sin that, that, that they committed, that they introduced. And so, and, and so when I explained that, he said, okay, oh, I got it. That makes sense. So let's do this. Let's have our, huh? Sean, Sean Jones, amen. Uh, he's one of our new members here at the church. Uh, him and his wife, Carol. Carol has a breathing. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. His name is Sean. His name is Sean. Her okay. name is Carol. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, the name yeah. Yes. 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 Very jovial. Very friendly guy. Uh, yeah. uh, reminds me of my godfather. Really. Uh, uh, have we ever taken the name in a picture? Uh, we, did. Right. We, we, we did. We did. We did. I, 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 we did. We did because. Well, it was the time. Maybe, I. I it was time because we, we, we also took in uh, to some fifth year members because we did it at the same time. Because there were some that weren't there the first time we did it, and then we the other ones that weren't there, we gave them the right hand at the same time we gave Brother Sean and Brother Carol. Well, let me share with you and get some action. In fact, can we, let's, can we, let's, let's do it off camera. Let's oh, do it off, okay. off, off camera. If we're going to have a closing word of prayer, then we can discuss anything you want to discuss. Okay. Dear Father God, thank you for blessing us, God. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you, God, for doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. God, we pray in this moment, at this hour, God, that you would continue to work with us, work in us, and work through us, 
so that, God, everything we do brings you glory, brings you honor, brings you praise. Father God, bless our families, bless our communities, bless those who are connected to us. Bless this church, God, so that this church is able to be exactly who you called it to be. God, bless us and, 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 and our members so that when we turn here on Sunday, we may be able to worship you in spirit and truth. It's in your son's mighty matchless, marvelous, magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. 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 Let me turn these off right quick. Amen.